We welcome you on tonight. Um, one initiative of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated is to enhance our environment. And under that initiative, we have um, been given the charge to encourage everyone within our communities to actually begin their own home gardens. And so that is our perspective and that is our objective tonight to help you to begin your own home garden. And at this time, I'm going to turn our uh, event over to one of my sorority sister, Mrs. Ophelia Stevens, and she will lead us from here and introduce us to our master gardener for this evening. Okay. Thank you, Leslie, for welcoming everyone and for your kind remarks. I am Ophelia Stevens, an EOE committee member, and I'm happy to introduce our speaker for tonight, Mr. Kent Phillips, Master Gardener of Howard County. Kent is a graduate of Maryland, of, of, the, of the University of Maryland Extension Service Program and has practiced in this capacity for well over 14 years. He specializes in growing vegetables and small fruits in raised beds and container gardens and has been doing so for over 47 years. In fact, the success of his raised bed gardens was featured in a lengthy Sun newspaper article in 2019. The article described how he turned a tiny plot at his Columbia home into a full-fledged garden. And so in his talk tonight on how to start a home garden, Kent will discuss how to prepare and maintain healthy soil for large and small gardens, for raised gardens, and for potted gardens. He will give ideas for planning continuous harvest, increasing yields, proper fertilization, and managing insects and pests. We will learn a simple crop rotation scheme for building healthy soil that our gardens, so that our gardens will provide fresh and healthy produce for most of the year. There are three protocols for this presentation that, I, that I'd like to talk about. And the first being questions and answers. The talk this evening will, this evening will include, will be one hour and will include time for questions. Questions will be answered in two ways. In the first instance, if you are present this evening via Zoom and you have a question, please raise your hand and you will be recognized. If you are watching via Facebook Live, please type your question in the comment section and, and the e EOE committee members who are monitoring Facebook Live will present your questions to Kent. In the event there are still questions after the talk, Ken has agreed to extend his time with us to answer them. The second protocol is in regard to reference documents. The PowerPoint deck from this presentation, the entire deck, as well as a gardening resource sheet with links to specific gardening topics were sent out to all participants who registered via Zoom. If you are on Facebook Live, Please type your email address in the comment section and we'll, we will see that you get the reference file. And the third protocol involves surveys for the program's evaluation. The first is the Master Gardener Survey. Kent has requested that all participants, Zoom and Facebook Live, complete the survey that can be accessed via link on the last PowerPoint slide that I previously discussed. This survey will be used to evaluate the how to start a home garden presentation tonight. And the, the second survey is of course, the Enhance Our Environment Survey, EOE. All participants who registered via Zoom will receive or have already received the link to complete the Enhance Our Environment Program Survey. Both the committee and Kent thank 
you in advance for taking the time to complete both surveys. So having said this, Kent, we're at the point that you may start your presentation whenever you are ready. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So without further ado, why don't we uh, go ahead and get into the uh, PowerPoint. And I'll start by saying it's how to start a raised bed and or a container garden, and I do both. My email address is there. Uh, if you have any specific questions about anything in here, you can email them to me, or you can also send a question to Ask Extension, which I will point out as we start to go through the PowerPoints, and I flip to some of the University of Maryland's websites. This is a uh, slide that we put in that basically says we don't discriminate for any reason. Uh, University of Maryland is uh, a non-discriminatory uh, institution and we and down down later on in the page if you find for any reason that you have been discriminated against there's information on this uh slide where you can test the discrimination University of Maryland Master Gardeners are part of University of Maryland Extension, which is part of the College of Ag and Natural Resources, which is part of the University of Maryland, which was one of the original land-grant universities in the United States of America. The University of Maryland runs six main programs. They are Ask a Master Gardener Plant Clinic, the Grow and Eat It, uh, committee, which I am the coordinator for, our Baywise committee, which basically attempts, or doesn't really attempt, it basically educates people on how to keep rainwater and pesticides and uh, fertilizers on their property if they use them. Our pollinator committee, which basically educates people about our native pollinators, our compost committee, which educates people on how to create uh, fertile soil by composting your own vegetables and vegetarian, uh, not even vegetarian, but all your organic materials on your own home property. And then we have our native plant committee, which is really tied to our Baywise group which talks about turning your garden into a garden using native plants, which helps native pollinators. Excuse me, Kent, Excuse can me. you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can't see your PowerPoint. Probably because I forgot to share it. No problem. Thank you. Oh, thank you for letting me know. I got started and went totally rambling on, which is what my usual operation, op, operation is here. Anyway, the Home and Garden Information Center is there. They have a ask extension service, which you can ask any um, question you want about your particular lawn, garden, uh, native plants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's also a Maryland Grows blog, which uh, gives a lot of pertinent information and very timely about what to do and when to do it. Our Master Gardener programs are all local. They're located in every county of the state. And the Grow at Idiot program, which is what I'm part of, is one of the premier programs of the University of Maryland Extension. We teach skills that promote food gardening, knowledge, and skills. We support master gardener demonstrations in schools and community gardens. 
and we work on projects with community partners and other UME programs like SNAP Ed and 4-H. Um, we also, I'll put in a plug here, we also run, beside running community gardens, we also run food gardens, which donate food to uh, the food banks at in Howard County. The food banks last year probably got somewhere in the neighborhood of four tons of fresh vegetables from food gardens that were uh, supported by University of Maryland Master Gardeners. University of Maryland uh, also provides a lot of information on pests, and you can find out about that by uh, asking extension. University of Maryland, as I said, also has a GROWS blog. They have a YouTube channel, which HGIC stands for Home and Garden Information Center. And we also have a social media on Facebook. So without further ado, I'll talk about the topics we're going to start tonight. We're going to talk about raised beds and containers. We'll talk about how to start each of them. We'll talk about conducting a soil test for a raised bed. We'll talk about making soil for raised beds. We'll talk about no-till, minimum raised, no-till or minimum till raised beds. We'll talk about fertilizers and caring for them. And we'll talk about three or four season use. For containers, we'll talk about general parameters, but I will be uh, discussing mostly our double University of Maryland's double five gallon self watering container that are made out of recycled five gallon buckets. I'll talk about the importance of right sizing containers depending on the size of the particular plant. The growing media, you notice I don't say soil, that goes in the containers and maintaining the containers throughout the course of the year. We're going to start with starting on a raised bed. I'll say that you should start small. Beds should be three or four feet wide, and you should start with one or two beds. Maximize sun exposure, minimum of eight hours a day for fruiting plants six hours a day for leafy greens, and it's easiest if you select a level area to create one. University of Maryland has a website, and you all are seeing the website right now, I hope. Is that true? No. No. We, we, Just we seeing your slide. slide. Okay, so I got to do a new share for the websites. All right, that's fine. Okay, this is University of Maryland's webpage on building raised beds. It basically lays out how to build raised beds and the advantages of them, some of the disadvantages, much more than I could ever go through in about an hour. It talks about what to make them out of and everything else. University of Maryland also uh, recommends that anytime you start to make a raised bed, you do a soil test in the area of the bed, and the soil test can be processed uh, by any one of the soil testing laboratories. University of Maryland's currently using the University of Delaware's laboratory, and that is working very well for us. The soil test there costs about $17. And you should do the soil test for the soil as it exists in the area where you're going to produce or where you're going to put your bed. There are several types of beds or two you types can... mainly. Sorry, yes. Kent, you're, you, you, we need you to share again. My apologies. Okay. 
And a quick, Kent, I have a quick question. Uh, Okay. as to the soil test with the University of Delaware, how long does that take and what are we actually looking for? What factors do we that are good in the soil that we're looking for? The, uh, what you're really looking for in the soil test is the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which are the major uh, macronutrients in the soil. And, and that's what you're really looking for with a soil test. It will also, University of Delaware also provides you with the amount of lead in your soil and whether it's safe to raise vegetables or not. That tends to be more important in the inner city where there was use of a lot of lead paints before they were outlawed and I think somewhere in the 1970s. And the University of Delaware also provides a uh, list of the minor micronutrients like sulfur and boron and manganese and things like that. So you'll get all this back in a soil test and it basically tells you how you have to fertilize your garden and normally it will recommend you'll also get ph levels and it will recommend how to adjust the ph the ph between 6.2 and 6.8 which are the optimal range or is the optimal range for vegetable gardening and it will tell you how to raise that ph and it will also tell you what other nutrients, specifically nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that you have to add to the soil. There are a number of materials you can use for raised beds. You can use rocks, untreated lumber that's either been painted with exterior latex paint or with oil-based stain. You can use synthetic lumber also. I would also say that for untreated lumber, one of the other things you can do is you can put a uh, plastic liner down on the inside of the bed to keep the water away from the lumber and keeping the lumber from decomposing. Uh, you can also use what we call ACQ lumber. And ACQ lumber is just lumber that has been treated with alkaline copper and we use it or i use it in my bordered raised beds which are 12 inches deep and four by eight for unbordered raised beds you basically mark out the raised beds and you keep the bed inside the line after doing your soil test where you're going to put your bed raised beds are most likely being made in a lawn so we'll this is going to this link will tell you how to do turf grass removal there's a no-till method the no-till method is also to some extent known as the lasagna method where you put down either four sheets of newspaper or brown untreated cardboard and then cover it with four to six inches of compost and then you go ahead and plant in the compost the minimum till method is you basically turn over the sod so that the green part of the grass is basically pointed down into the soil. That puts more nutrients back into the soil since the nutrients are in the first inch or so of the grass. And you use the same steps as above and then add your compost on top of that. For soil for raised beds, most people go to the Howard County Alpha Ridge Landfill and they get Hoco Grow, which is a uh, commercially produced uh, compost that's produced up at uh, Alpha Ridge Landfill. It's produced in a high temperature bed of about anywhere from between 140 to 160 degrees which kills all the pathogens in it. The link to fertilizer is basic. Provide fertilizer recommendations that you'll receive in your soil test. 
how to convert them for smaller uh, vegetable gardens that uh, you and I have. And then it also talks, you know, it will talk raised beds, talks about planting your desired crop right through your uh, compost. And I'll say this, you'd be surprised at how little fertilizer you actually need for a four by eight bed. In my case, uh, my beds are made up of 12 inches of compost on top of the soil that was in place when we bought this house. And I have been growing vegetables in that, so in that compost for about six years now. And when I fertilize it, it takes about 1.2 ounces of urea to fertilize that bed, which is, uh, I actually have to get Mary's kitchen scale out to uh, measure it out at such a small amount. It's equivalent to about two or three tablespoons of urea. Raised beds are great because they warm sooner. The bed you see here is... One of my uh, beds that was planted in garlic, you can get the idea, that's that's almost a whole bed of garlic, almost a four by eight bed. So you get an idea that Mary likes to use a lot of garlic in her cooking. One of the cons about raised beds is that they uh, dry out a little more quickly in the summer heat. I have solved that problem, although it really doesn't show in this photo by using drip irrigation and said by setting the drip irrigation to go on at specific points in time to keep water on bed. Uh, if you're making res be raised beds, as we said earlier, three to four feet wide works well. That way you can reach in from the side of the bed and pick whatever you need to and you don't ever have to walk on the bed and compress the soil. I left two foot footpaths around my raised beds, but you can certainly leave enough room for you to be comfortable. And as I already talked about, no soil compaction and working from both sides. I uh, can't. Uh, I have another question about the raised sure. beds. Sure. Uh, you indicated that they should be lying in plastic at the bottom. Uh, no, they. Um... We just put them on straight on top of the soil that's there. Okay. And by using either four sheets of uh, newspaper or untreated cardboard, it basically kills the grass that's underneath of it or any weeds or okay. anything else for that matter. The only reason we would use plastic would mm -hmm. be if the soil itself was contaminated so if you had real lead contamination in your soil or something, if you were in the inner city, you could okay. actually do it that way. Okay. So if you yeah. did use the plastic, what about drainage, the water? Uh, water, yes. the, the compost drains very, very well. Okay. And raised beds in general, that's one of the... Uh, it's a benefit in the spring because with all the rain that we normally get around here in the spring, it rains and the beds drain very, very well. The next day they'll be perfectly dry and probably dry down to about a half inch or so. And then as the week goes along, they dry out even a little more. Uh, however, one of the bad things about raised beds is that during the summer heat, they dry out significantly faster. And the plants themselves, as the plants grow larger, they will dry out the soil also because the roots are sucking up uh, moisture all the time. It's one of the reasons why I use drip irrigation. You can sort of see the drip tube at the back of each one of these beds, although the, the drip tube is not in the bed itself. You can see the outlets for it. The bed on the left is basically kale, broccoli, uh, sugar snap peas, and lettuce. The bed on the right is basically a uh, planting of probably, it looks like uh, carrots and certainly some green beans. I would imagine there's some beets in there and also some radishes at the very front end of the bed. 
The key to success in your raised beds is soil, and it's soil enriched with lots of organic matter. What the organic matter does is whether you have sandy soil or whether you have perfect soil, which is a loam mix, or whether you have clay, by putting in compost, which is rich in organic matter, it enables the plants to grow better. It holds plenty of moisture and it will basically allow you to grow great vegetables. You should do a so University of Maryland recommends doing a soil test every three to five years. In my case, I use my bed so hard and literally I garden. My, my gardening starts actually in October of the previous year, which is when I plant my garlic. My broccoli, cauliflower, and kale is growing downstairs in pots to be transplanted in the garden April 1. So my garden will be used from literally the previous year with garlic starting in April 1. It will really start with other cool season vegetables. I'll rotate through summer vegetables like squash and tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, things like that. And then in the fall, I'll go back to cool season vegetables. So my, my garden literally, I use it through, I would say, April through December. One of the things you also have to recommend is that every time you pull a crop out, you have to replace the nutrients. So you basically put in fertilizer uh, at the same rate that you did to put it in initially. The ideal deep fertile soil is high in organic matter, minimum of six to 12 inches of organic matter in the soil. What you're really shooting for is you're seeding for a... Uh, percent of organic matter which is over four percent and that actually provides a lot of nutrients to the plants themselves that organic literally compost is an organic fertilizer but it's not enough to feed the plants entirely but what it does is it builds the soil and allows the soil to hold any fertilizer that you put on it you can see in the right-hand uh, photo there is a handful of real dark, heavily concentrated organic matter in soil. And you can tell it's a heavy organic matter soil because it's got worms in it. And the worms are basically decomposing the soil and providing nitrant, nutrients that uh, plants can use. One of the things we talk about, or I talk about, is close planting, and it's one of the things that we do in small gardens, and that is instead of planting in rows, we plant in blocks. The example that I have down below is a four-foot uh, raised bed, and the broccoli, which is the bee, is planted on 12-inch centers with a lettuce planted in between it. So that takes up about three and a half feet of the bed, maybe even four feet with, uh, let's see, three, six, nine broccoli plants and the same number of lettuce plants. And the lettuce gets harvested before the broccoli gets really, really big. So you're basically getting two crops out of the same space. Another example is you plant beets and carrots thin to about three inches each. Uh, and you would plant that in a very tight group like you broccoli and cauliflower, except it'd be three inches apart instead of 12 inches apart. And squash, you need about two or three feet. So in my four foot raised beds, I would basically put two squash plants in side by side at the end of one of the raised beds. Uh, the leafy canopy shades the soil. It reduces moisture loss and keeps weeds down. Here's a good example of the broccoli plants, how close they're tighted, how close they're planted. Here you can actually see that I've got four in raised beds. 
So there's 12 inches on the side and then, or six inches on either side of the raised bed and then 12 in the center. And the two squash plants are a new squash variety that Mary found two years ago called uh, Robin's Kogo Nut. And it's a cross between butternut squash and a bocha squash. Again, you can see one of the other space-saving devices we use, which is a trellis. Cages can support plants, and we normally plant taller vegetables on either the north or the west side here. This is the west side of the garden, and those peas will get up to about three, three and a half feet, and they'll climb right up that uh, little fence that's there. It saves space on the garden floor and allows me to go ahead and pick the peas uh, with no problem at all. These are This is an example of how you would start planting your garden in mark, and it gives you an idea of how intensive you can use a three foot or four foot wide bed. You start with arugula, radishes, spinach, and kale in one bed. And that gets started in mid-March to the 1st of April. Then illustrations for April, you plant some broccoli at the west end of the bed, cauliflower at the west end of the other bed. You can plant chard, carrots, beets, or whatever other vegetable you like. And then by mid-May, you'll have your beans in. Your carrots will be probably ready to be picked as with your as will your beets you'll pull out your uh arugula and radishes and plant tomatoes and where you had your spinach you will plant peppers and eggplants and you notice they're on the north side based on the way the arrow is then for june your tomatoes peppers and eggplants are starting to produce Squash and cucumbers have been put in on the west side of the bed and probably trellised, and they replace your uh, brosca crops of broccoli and cauliflower. So that's just a good example of some succession planning. Here's another University of Maryland example of succession planning, things that you would plant in the spring garden, then replace those things with things in the summer garden like beets, carrots, cucumbers, eggplants, peppers. And then in the fall, you would start again with some cooler season crops like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, carrots, chard, collard, collards, kale, kohlrabi, mustard, and other things that do well in the uh, fall garden. I've actually picked Brussels sprouts up for, through Christmas in some of my gardens, depending on how uh, cold it gets in the winter. Succession planning is just where we successively sow some of the same plant to keep the harvest going. So we may, in my case, I usually use uh, snap beans or green beans as an example. And I will plant small squares of green beans and I'll plant them every, I'll plant a new one about every three weeks starting probably at the 1st of May. And that will bring in string beans all throughout the gardening year. Uh, you do continuing sowing of every few weeks of the lettuce and arugula very early. With beans, I just use an example. Radishes, you would sow in the early spring and then in the late fall. Spinach the same way. And stagger your planting. So early cabbage and broccoli might be followed by snap beans or zucchini. That way you don't uh, draw the same nutrients out of the soil by growing the same crop at the same time. We'll get into a little bit about container gardening. This is a little trudge that I carry around uh, and I will have one like this, except it'll have different uh, lettuces in it. But this trudge, this little container is four inches deep and probably about uh, 15 or so inches long and maybe 12 inches wide. And it's got uh, one, two, three, it's got 12 lettuce plants in it. 
and you can see it's full and you can actually just pick off individual leaves to make a salad out of during the course it actually sits out on my uh back porch during the spring and mary and i just make salads off of it but that's a good example of a container garden in a very small space other container gardens i have is the top photo shows my uh tomato containers they these are 24 inch pots that sit on my back deck they're Tomatoes are caged in them. The picture on the right is a good picture of the tomatoes in August. And it gives you an idea how large they get. And all you have to do is fertilize them every two weeks and keep them watered. The lower left picture is basil, uh, eggplants, peppers. And there's a pepper in the yellow box or yellow container, but you can't really see it. These containers are simply filled, the, the larger containers like the one that the tomatoes in are probably filled with a 50-50 mix of soilless mix and compost. The five gallon buckets, which we'll talk about a little later on are filled with straight compost in most cases. Container gardening is basically the same as your uh, in ground garden, you want to place it in full sun or the most sun you absolutely have. Grow it on a patio or porch. Use space saving varieties, uh, barrels, buckets, planters, tubs, wading pools. I used to have a picture of a kid's wading pool in here that was filled with uh, soilless mix and people. We had, they were growing tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, squash out of it, the whole thing. The only thing you have to be careful of about containers is you're going to have some overflow of water. So if you have a wooden deck or a deck that stains, you have to be careful about that. But the thing about containers is you can use your imagination. So, Kent. Sure. On my deck, I get a lot of squirrels that jump off the trees and run around on the deck. Yep. Do they bother the plants much? They will occasionally take a bite out of a tomato, but other than that, no, I've got the same problem in my uh, yard. I've got uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about five squirrels that regularly visit my bird feeders, but uh, I have baffles up on them so they can't get to the bird food. So they just stay on the ground underneath the bird food uh, or bird seed uh, containers and basically pick up what the birds drop. But no, other than that, I've never had a problem on my deck with containers, with any of the containers. I've, occasionally, they'll take a bite out of a, of, an, of a tomato, but that doesn't mean the whole tomato is bad. It just means that it's got a little chunk out of it. Answer so, your question? Sure, yeah, go ahead. It, it. So, Kent, another question. Someone <laughs> made the comment, the deer. Yes. Um, and that's a problem I have, the deer. Well, so this is this is this is where I get my joke in. <laughs> I have the perfect solution for deer. It's called freezer. You put them in your freezer, you get free organic meat. But if you're like me and you live in a residential neighborhood where everybody is basically you know cheek to jowl or at most 20 feet apart uh you basically have to keep the deer out of your garden with fencing and that's what i have around my garden i have a four foot fence and because they're because i have four raised beds inside of an area with uh two foot around each bed there's no place that a deer can actually jump into the bed without hurting itself by either landing in the bed or landing on the you know in the path and hanging itself up so i've never had a deer problem with a four foot fence in my previous garden where i had 1500 square feet in my backyard yes i had a deer problem and i ended up uh putting 500 linear feet of uh, deer netting around the whole garden. And that deer netting was eight foot tall. Okay. 
So what about for containers? Because I've tried containers and if you're placing the containers at the same level that the deer can get to, you'll have to fence them in or do something like that. Okay. Can we have another question. Amy Harris sure. has a, a question. Mm -hmm. Yes. So with the container plants, do you have to water them more frequently than a raised bed? It, it depends. Uh, it depends on two things. It depends on a how hot and dry it is. In the spring, you find that, you know, when we have lots of rain and the plants are very small, that they don't. These five-gallon buckets that I have here and the length that I have to a five-gallon bucket is actually uh, a link to, and it, that contains basically a YouTube video that takes about eight minutes about how to develop or how to make these five gallon buckets. This is just an example of one that I've used for years and years and years. But to answer your question, if the buckets are at the same level the deer are, so basically if they're on a patio or something that's accessible to the deer, then yes, you basically have to uh, put a fence or something like that around them. The other thing you could do is you could, depending on, um, depending, I, I use row cover a lot, and row cover is a spun-bound polyester. I use it in the spring and fall, and I have used it for deer protection, too. It's a spun-bound polyester. It's very light. It comes in white. And you can drape that over the plants that you want to keep the deer off of. The other thing you can do is you could drape a fine net over top of them. Or, you know, for those of you who do a lot of sewing and buy material, you'll, you could uh, just get coolie from the uh, uh, from the uh, you know, sewing place where you buy fabric Joanne's and fabric. yeah you could basically joanne's fabric sure yeah. that's the word i was actually looking for was joanne's but uh that would work but mine are up on a deck that's probably about 10 feet above uh the ground level in the back of the house so uh it works well for me okay and kent as to container uh gardening what package soil would you recommend for uh, vegetables growing in containers? I use straight compost. Straight com oh, compost. Now, the other thing you can use, and I have used before, is compost is cheaper for me than buying soilless mix. Compost, you can buy compost at the Howard County Alpha Ridge Landfill for $12 a half a yard or $24 for a full yard. But that means that uh, you have to have a method of moving it. Uh, I have all these buckets and I'll go up and buy a half yard and then load Mary's uh, Volvo up with all these buckets filled with compost. And that's about a half yard of compost. Or you can have, they actually have people that will deliver it to you just like they deliver mulch. So you can buy it by the yard, two yards, three yards, depending upon how large a garden you want to start. Other than that, I would recommend using soilless mix, which is, uh, it's just a mixture of uh, peat moss, vermiculite, and perlite. You can get it at any good garden center. Uh, I find that the cheapest place to get it is uh frank's frank's nursery which is over and back at costco in i guess that's jessup over there it might still be it might be elk ridge or it might be yeah it's i'm familiar with uh, with frank's yeah garden. and they have it in uh three cubic foot bags and they also have it in uh compressed bales that are a little over 3.8 cubic feet but they tend to be very heavy. They tend to be about 50 pounds. So unless you've got uh, some body that can move a 50-pound bale, 
you know, and then you've got to fluff it up because it's compressed. The only thing with soilless mix is before you put it in the container, you do have to moisten it first. And so that's the one thing I would recommend. Any other questions? Yes. Um, there are a couple of more questions. Well, you had mentioned earlier um, some type of netting to cover the mm -hmm. uh, containers. Someone didn't understand the word, so they asked if you could spell it. Bully? Oh, maybe that's what it was. Yes. You said bully? Bully with a T. Oh, it's the, cool. yeah, it's the netting that you use when you're doing, when you're sewing and stuff like that. I'm, <laughs> I don't use tool. it, but. It's called tool, T-U-L-L. -L. Tool. Tool. Yeah. So, so the E is silent? Yes, it's tool. Yeah, okay. That is a netting, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the next question is, what sure. can we do to control those white butterflies? But like ah. <laughs> ah. my favorite pest, those little white butterflies are actually not butterflies. They're moss, believe it or not. And they're in the larval stage. They're called imported cabbage loopers. And they're little green, for lack of a better word, larvae. Sometimes we use the terms worms. And what you see down here in the lower right is a cauliflower I grew in a bucket. And to keep the larvae, you, there, there are several ways to take care of that larvae. One, you can either spray it on a regular basis with a herbicide. Well, it's not really an herbicide. It's although we classify it as, but it's really a bacterial and it's bacterial. What we call it is BT for short, but it stands for Bacillus thuringus. And it basically, when the caterpillar eats a leaf that uh, has Bacillus thuringus on it, it basically clogs up their digestive system. They can't digest, and as a result, they die. The other thing you can uh, use on the cabbage or any of the, any of the brassica plants, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kale. The other thing that you can use is you can use uh, uh, Captain Jack's uh, dead bug brew, which contains uh, spinosade in it, which is another organic uh, pesticide, which again, kills chewing insects. Now, having said all that, the way I the little white butterflies off my uh, plants in the spring, off my all my broscas, is I cover it with row cover. And if you go in to the University of Maryland's website and just do a search for row cover, it will show you what it's like. And it's just that it's a spun bound polyester that's white. And the butterflies can't basically get through it. So it basically keeps your uh, brassica plants free of the larvae of the little white butterflies. Did you say road cover? Row, R-O-W. Okay. It, okay. And it, it, you know, that's the, that's the generic name for it. The other name for it is by the specific company which produces it, which is Agrabond. But uh, you can find it at any, again, at any good garden store or southern states or anything like that. So, if there's no more. Another nope, question? No. Okay, go ahead. Oh, oh yes. And we've been waiting for you. Um, been waiting for me to stop, huh? No. <laughs> we appreciate you. Um, so someone asked if banana, and I'm assuming maybe they, they're talking about the pill, uh, or coffee grinds, are they actually beneficial to the plants? 
The coffee grinds themselves are, they're very high in nitrogen, but they need to be composted before you put them on the plants. They are, it, it's not a, how to phrase it, it's an organic material that has to be acted on by microbes to release the nitrogen in it. Uh, bananas, I've never heard being used on plants specifically, but you could certainly compost them and it would produce good organic matter. Okay, it was actually banana water, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but she said... No, I've never heard water. of that being used for anything. I've heard a compost tea being used. I don't know whether that's what they were shooting at. A lot of people will put compost in a uh, docking or some sort of container and we'll leave it in, for lack of a better word, a five-gallon bucket to soak overnight. And then they will use that water to water their plants. And it draws the nutrients out of the compost because the nutrients are water-soluble. And you can use that on your plants. And I hear a lot of people that use that. Okay. Another question is, sure. how do you handle the white fuzz or fungus on step on plant stems and then the person stated it appears to spread from one plant to another and then uh -huh. she asked do you have to use bleach water to remove it no the what i assume we're talking about here is a uh mildew it it looks like a fungus, but it gets on the leaves also. It's not just on the stems itself. And it's called powdery mildew. And it happens when you get high humidity and uh, hot weather during the summer. That's when it's worst at its worst. And if you don't have really good air circulation around your plants, that's what tends to happen is the... Uh, Moisture tends to sit on the plants and you start to get powdery mildew. Again, if you're looking for, a, I don't have a solution for it right off the top of my head, but if you're looking for a solution for it, you can go into the University of Maryland's website and either type in powdery mildew there or downy mildew that goes by different names. Or you can ask the extension agents by just clicking on the extension button you can provide them with a picture, tell them what your problem is, and ask them if there's any cure for it. But right off the top of my head, I don't know of any. Other than keeping good circulation around your plants. Next question. That's it for the moment. Okay. Uh, what you see in the left-hand picture is a photo of a five gallon double bucket on my back porch that I had eggplants in one year. Gives you an idea how well it does. The uh, two on the right hand side of the pepper are beige. One is a pe picture of a pepper called Gypsy that I grew, that's actually in a single five gallon bucket as is the cauliflower uh, below, which was also grown in a single five gallon bucket before we developed the five gallon double bucket routine. The nice thing about the five gallon double bucket routine is once the plant starts to get fairly large, there is a water reservoir in the bottom of the plant. And somebody was asking how long, how often you have to water the double buckets. And basically, uh, even with a plant as large as that pepper is, I would probably only water it every other day. And that would be fine because it, there'd be a water reserve down in the bottom that's about two inches deep. And the roots will go right down through the holes I showed the holes that were punched in the bottom of the bucket and you put screen material over the holes to keep the soilless mix or your compost in that bucket and the, the roots of the plant will go right down through the screen through the holes and right into the bottom of the five gallon bucket. Uh, so Kent, you're actually drilling those holes um, in that bucket. 
correct? I'm sorry. Yeah, they're about a half inch in diameter. Okay. Mm -hmm. And effectively, you can't have too many. I mean, I probably got tired of drilling there because there's only nine, but I could have put another couple on the outside edges here. To oh. add, you know. So one of the yes. questions was actually about the holes. Do you have to put the holes in the bottom of the bucket? You have to, that's the bucket that goes inside of the second bucket. The, 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 the inside bucket is the one on the left and the one on the right is the outside bucket. And you can see the hole that's, I don't know whether you're seeing my uh, cursor here, but you can see the hole that's in the side of that bucket. And that allows any excess water that's above the bottom of the bucket to wow. basically drain out. So basically what you're keeping there is you're keeping somewhere in approximately two to three inches in the bottom of that bucket that's going to have water in it that's the self-watering part of the bucket. Uh, container size is very important. You sort of saw or got an impression of that by looking at the size of the containers that I had on the back porch for the full-size tomatoes that I grow. Uh, for large vegetables, uh, one plant per, contain per container, a minimum of, and I would say 10 gallons, although those containers were probably 20, the pots in the back, you need depth of 12 to 16 inches. Examples are tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, uh, cucumbers, winter squash. The only thing I'll say is that the larger the vegetable and the smaller the container, the more frequently you're going to water it. Medium-sized vegetables, five-gallon pots are great. Uh, dwarf variety, and I don't plant dwarf varieties of peppers or eggplants. I used to try dwarf varieties of tomatoes and never really had any luck with them, so I'm back to growing my old-style tomatoes. Uh, summer squash tends to get very large, so you're going to water it a lot. Uh, old crops, which are broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, collards, uh, kale, beans. When, when I say beans and Swiss chard and carrots and stuff like that, I don't grow them in pots. I grow them in containers that are somewhere in the neighborhood of eight inches deep and I don't see it was 20 inches by maybe 12 or 14 inches wide. And you can grow carrots, beets, beans in those. I made my daughter a, uh, uh, Bean uh, container out of a, uh, well, they call it, they call it a mud tray, which you mix cement in. I just drilled holes in the bottom of it for drainage, put a screen on the bottom and filled it with about six inches of compost. And my daughter, or my one of my daughters, I have four daughters. One of my daughters was growing green beans on her back porch because she loves them. The problem is she never get any because her dog used to go out and eat them. So just gives you an idea that uh, it's not the deer that are the big problem. It's really the household animals that are a problem. And then in smaller smaller containers, you can grow uh, things that are smaller, like the lettuces was a good example. The lettuce container I had earlier was only four inches deep, and it had 12 lettuce plants in it. So it works very well for things like that that are in and out fairly quickly. Growing meteor for container soilless mix. It's lightweight, drains well, holds water and nutrients. It starts out with a popper pH. Some of the soilless mixes are pro mix, ready earth, jiffy mix, sunshine mix. Uh, other container media are anything from 100% compost to a 50 50 mix of soilless mix and compost. Uh, the compost would add slow release nutrients, but you'll still have to fertilize it probably every two weeks. And you'll fertilize it either one of two ways. You can either use a uh, long acting fertilizer like Osmocote, which you would mix in according to label instructions uh, at the very beginning of the planting season, 
or you can water it every two weeks with something like Miracle Grow or a balanced plant, uh, water soluble plant food. Maintaining containers, uh, watering depends on the size of the container and the size of the plant. And Container should keep moist at all times. I use the finger test. I stick my finger in the container down about an inch. If it doesn't feel damp, I will water the container. And does everybody know what a water breaker is? I often ask this question. A lot of people don't know what a water breaker is. A water breaker is a contraption that goes on the end of the hose. And instead of getting one stream coming out of the hose, you'll get a bunch of little fine streams that basically uh, don't, while it floods the soil, it doesn't wash the soil away. It's the same idea that you would get out of the rows on a uh, watering can where you get a whole bunch of holes in the end of a, uh, the end of the watering can and it provides a soft flow of water out of the watering can instead of one great big uh, deluge. You can use drip irrigation like I do on a timer, which works really, really well. Uh, again, I talked a little bit about uh, fertilization. You can either use a water-soluble uh, dry powder and mix it in your watering can and water every two weeks in the container, or you can use a slow-release rosin-coated uh, mixed with the media. Uh, Osmocote is one of them, but that's a brand name. There are other names available. But again, you should read and follow the label directions. And you don't want to over-fertilize your plant because the nitrogen in the fertilizer can actually burn the leaves of the plant and burn your plant. Any questions about fertilization of containers? It's a little different than fertilizing your in-bed garden in your in-bed garden you're going to be using a granular fertilizer of some sort and in the uh, container you're going to be using using a dry soluble powder or some slow release uh, rosin coated mixed with the media well that's the end of my talk uh, this is our final slide to let you know that the program was brought to you by the university of maryland extension master gardener program which is we're in Howard County. And the link or the QR code at the bottom, which could be included, so you don't have to try to capture it here in either the PDF or the Word file that you received uh, when you signed up. So with that, we'll take questions. Any other questions? There are. Well, Good. So, who, um, um, Ophelia, did you want to go through the remaining questions? No. Um, I, you, I'm trying to get to them, but if you already see them, uh, sure. Leslie, I could you do it, them. please? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, one question is: How long should ladybugs stick around when introduced to raised gardens? Anything we can do to make it more attractive to stay? Provide them more food. <laughs> ladybugs, ladybugs, or ladybird beetles, as they're more properly called, are basically predators. And what they eat are they eat aphids, as does their uh, larvae, which... And, you know, I could go in and pull a, a picture from the University of Maryland uh, website to show you what the lady bird beetles larvae looks like. But they're awesome aphid predators. So if you have a lot of aphids on your plants, they will stick around as long as the aphids are there. Once the aphids are gone, they'll move on. So we normally don't advise people to buy predatory insects to put on their plants uh normally we suggest row cover to keep them off or we'll uh suggest a organic pesticide to apply to the chewing bug that whatever and an aphid is a chewing bug 
and that will take care of the uh, aphid as the shoes on the plant. Okay. No, mostly aphids are actually really very easy to get rid of. You can hit them with a spray of water and they can't get back up on the plant. So you just wash them off. Okay. So the next question is, what can we use to control snails, slugs? Snails and slugs, you can use Mary's old favorite, which is you put them on the sidewalk and you sprinkle them with salt and watch them foam away. Uh, there are a couple of ways that we as gardeners do it. And first is we'll put down diatomaceous earth, which is basically what's used in, in uh, swimming pool filters. And diatomaceous earth is basically real, although it doesn't hurt people. It's real sharp. And as the slugs crawl over it, it will pierce their skin. But you'd have to buy a lot of diatomaceous earth to do that. What I do in my garden when I start to see slug damage is one of two things. I will either take a board out, a small piece of board, and put it in the garden and then turn it over every morning and pick off the slugs that are underneath of it and put them in a bucket of uh, soapy water, which kills them. The other thing that I find that works real well is if you take, for instance, if you have a, once you're finished with your cantaloupe or your uh, melon of any kind, if you take that and put that out in the garden, slugs love it, and they'll actually crawl up underneath and start chewing on it. And then you just throw it in the compost or your green bin if you're in Howard County. Okay. Thank you. There are there, there there are pesticides for slugs too, but as a organic gardener, I don't like to recommend them. Okay, thank you. Especially for vegetable gardens. Um, uh, someone wants you to give us again where we can get compost here in Howard County. The that's the place to get it, and you can buy it in a lot of different places. The best place to buy it is up at the Alpha Ridge Landfill, and it's back in their wood waste facility. And the reason I push the Alpha Ridge Landfill's compost is because that compost, every batch that comes out of that uh, facility actually has a lab test associated with it. So you can tell what nutrients it has in it, whether it has any heavy metals uh, you know, or, or any other bad things. And they won't release anything that's uh, basically detrimental to a garden. So while you can buy compost in a lot of places, and I'm sure there's a lot of good places to buy compost, I recommend that one simply because they do a lab test on every run of compost that they make up there. It's a huge facility now. It used to be a very small facility, but they must have eight or 10 bins that they use, concrete line bins that are somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 feet wide, maybe 50 feet long that they make compost in. And they can make compost in six weeks up there with their hot bins. So another question, if using fabric pots from... Mm -hmm into season is there anything special that um the person needs to do when reusing them for a new season uh the pots themselves no whatever uh depending on well i won't even say depending normally if they're using compost or soilless mix, they can use it for two years, but it would have to be placed in a plastic bag so it wouldn't leach out during the summer or not actually during the winter, not during the summer, because in the summer it's going to have plants in it. But I tried uh, fabric and it didn't really work well for me. And that was because in most instances, the fabric is black and it dries out fairly quickly, much more quickly than my uh, plastic five-gallon buckets. 
and I was using seven gallon fabric bags. Okay. Um, in your the uh, the information you provided us, you mentioned in the beginning about the soil tests that University of Delaware will do. Um, yes. Just tell us how we can get that in your. Sure. If you go into and click on the soil test link that's either in the Word file or in the uh, PDF that you guys sent out, mm -hmm. if you click on that, it will bring up the University of Maryland soil test page. And it tells you how to do a soil test. And it gives you a number of options on where to send it. We just use the University of Delaware because it's close. It again is one of our sister land grant colleges. They do a good soil test for 17 bucks. And, uh, you know, all you're going to tell them is this, you're doing this for a vegetable garden. Okay. There, there are, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. The only thing I was going to say is that they will ask you specifically what you're going to grow in that area. So my favorite example is blueberries. So while vegetables like a pH between 6.2 and 6.8, which is pretty neutral, not quite sweet soil. It's just a hair on the acidic side. Blueberries like real acid soil. So they like pHs down around four or five or five. So you really have to moderate the soil for blueberries. And I did that for 25 years in my other house. I was always putting sulfur down on my blueberries to keep the soil acidic so they would grow. Okay. But how long do, do they take to get the results back to you? Do you know? Normally, this time of year, probably about three weeks, okay. Okay. which is plenty of time. I mean, once you do the soil test itself, you can go ahead and build the bed okay. and put the compost in it. You know, and then what you would do is you just fertilize on top of the compost. Got it. One of the things I didn't say, and I sort of glossed over it, was no-till gardening. No-till gardening is a method whereby when you're using compost or a mixture of compost and soil that you, and University of Maryland recommends that you add about an inch of compost to every garden every year, okay, once you get it started and once you start to get the organic matter percentage up in it. But literally, in a no-till garden, it's literally that. You never turn the soil over. So all you do is pull the weeds out and plant. Pull the weeds out and plant. At the end of the season, you basically clean off all the debris, and you can either plant a cover crop, which I didn't talk about at all, or you can just lay that soil fallow. And then in the beginning of the spring, or even in the fall, you can put another inch of compost on it plant right through the compost and you're in good shape. Great. Mm -hmm. Another question came up and sure. then I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Ophelia Stevens if she has any closing uh, comments and then to my co-chairman, uh, Sabrina Daly. Before I ask this last question, um, Mr. Phillips, I don't know if you had an opportunity to look at the uh, comments, but we, the, the you have raving <laughs> reviews. <laughs> we are so grateful. And and Miss um, um, Stevens may share a couple of those perhaps as she closes. And then um, again, Miss Sabrina Daly will close us out and thank our guests. But the last question, and I don't know if you know an answer, but is there any place to get the five gallon buckets for free? Do you know? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Giant, Safeway. <laughs> they get they get icing in them. They get pickles in them. The I, you know, not knowing where you all are located. Uh, Red Howard County, primarily. Okay, up in Clarksville, there's a bagel bin up there that uh, you know you can ask them. They get pickles and 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 uh, cream cheese in them. Um, there's one down here by the hospital called uh, Mad City Coffee. Okay. They have them. And normally, 
you know, the most I, I've actually paid occasionally like a buck for a bucket. But the Giants and place like that, they give them away for free because they just throw them in the trash. Yeah. Okay. So any of the fast food places that, you know, get things from, um, uh, what's the purveyor of uh, all the, anyway, food stuffs, and I just can't remember. See their trucks. Cisco. Oh. You know, you, you see all their trucks and, you know, they're all, they're all full of five gallon buckets i mean you go to a bar if they make strawberry daiquiris they got five gallon buckets of strawberries <laughs> you know and they throw those buckets away so they'll save them for you, you just have to pick them up thank you or so... tell them to save them for you yeah no they're all free they're free they they just they're made out of and since we're talking about five gallon buckets they're all food grade okay. they are uh, and the way to tell a food grade bucket, no matter what its color is, if you turn it around on the bottom and you look at the, there'd be a triangle on the bottom with a number inside of it. And the number should be number two. And it should say around the top of the triangle or the bottom of the triangle, it'll say HDPE and number two. And the HDPE stands for high density polyethylene, which is a food grade plastic. That's why you get pickles in it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Ophelia and then Sabrina. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Leslie. And my hat is off to you, uh, Kent, for such a, a tremendous uh, program tonight. And judging from the questions that Leslie asked you, this was received so very well. And I'm so proud that uh, you were able to be with us. And Ken, on behalf of the Enhance Our Environment Committee, I Oda Lambda Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, I'd like to thank you for your excellent presentation on home gardening. And I extend a personal thank you for all the time and efforts you shared with me and the EOE Committee in bringing this gardening program to fruition. I am very grateful for that. Thank you. Oh. As a result of this presentation, I think we may all be ready to try our hands at gardening. And who knows, I think you may have unlocked a lot, a whole bunch of green thumbs tonight. So, right. so without closing comments, I would like to open the floor to the EOE committee chairs and chapter program chair for any closing comments for, for you, and or the gardening presentation. Sabrina. Sabrina. Thank you, Mrs. Stevens. Um, before we actually close out, if our chapter president, Dr. Leslie, I'm sorry, Dr. Angelo L. Williams, or our first vice president, um, Dr. Melody Moral Morales, if you have anything that you would like to say before we actually close out, I just want to say thank you. This has been a fantastic um, informational session, and we look forward to perhaps Ken having you back with us again. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, okay. So, um, um, Dr. Morales, are you out there? So, Ken, again, we thank you so much for your presentation. Just like everyone has already said, we're getting lots of positive feedback already. We would like to thank our guests, whether you're attending um, via Zoom, and I'm not sure if we still have any Facebook Live participants, but we thank you so much for your attendance tonight. Now, you're going to receive a survey from um, the members of the IOTA Lambda Omega chapter. It's a very, very brief survey because we want your feedback on um, whether you thought this presentation was useful, and if we were ever have the opportunity to do it again, would you participate? So we would really, really love it if you would fill out that feedback form and um, so that we can share that information with um, our chapter as well as our international organization. And again, thank you to everyone that participated with us tonight. Okay, and uh, with that, uh... Sabrina, I'm going to, uh, if there are no more questions or comments, this will include, conclude rather,
the Enhance Our Environment presentation of how to start a home garden. Thank you, everyone, and have Thank a so much. Good rest of the evening. Thank you, and please do the Thank survey you. for kids oh, yes, as well. Please do the survey, both of them, the Master Garden Survey as well as the Enhance Our Environment Survey. Yes. Thank you, Thank one you. and all. I've survey. enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Kent, Kent's survey is on the Word document. Yes, in the okay. Word doc. It's, the slide. it's the last slide. Yes. On the, the PowerPoint, last slide. Yes. PowerPoint deck. Yes. Okay. Good night, everybody. Unless you want to. Good night. Okay. Good night.